Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Ryan coming to you from my office again with another step one question review. Today's question is from the boards and beyond QBank sent to me by a student. So let's jump right in. So the question says a 60 year old man is evaluated for dyspnea and leg swelling. He has smoked two packs of cigarettes per day for 40 years. Vital signs include pulse 90 per minute, blood pressure 160 over 92, and respirations of 24. Diffuse wheezing is present on lung examination. Jugular venous pressure is increased, and there is 2 plus lower extremity pitting edema. On cardiac examination, there is a 2 out of 6 holosystolic murmur that increases in intensity during inspiration. S1 and S2 are distant. The point of maximal impulse is palpable below the sternum. Abdominal examination identifies hepatomegaly. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this man's presentation? And the answer choices are mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, core pulmonale, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and cardiac tamponade. Okay, so this is a nice example from the Boards and Beyond QBank of a type of question you may see on your actual step exam, but one of the more difficult types of questions. Not all questions on your step exam are going to be this hard. So when you read this question, many of you are going to think that this man has heart failure because he has many clinical findings of heart failure. And he does have heart failure, but he has a special type of heart failure called core pulmonale, which is related to lung disease. So let's walk through this and talk about how you come up with this answer. So they tell you that he has dyspnea and leg swelling. And you may know these are classic findings in patients who have heart failure. But you can also get dyspnea from COPD, and then they tell you that he smoked two packs of cigarettes for 40 years, so he very well may have dyspnea from COPD, but you should not get leg swelling from COPD. The only way COPD can cause leg swelling is if the COPD has led to right heart failure, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So he's got some vital signs here. His blood pressure is up a little bit. He's breathing at a high respiratory rate, and he has diffuse wheezing on lung exam. So this is a very important finding right here because you would not expect diffuse wheezing in someone who has left heart failure. When patients have left heart failure, they can develop pulmonary edema. This usually leads to rails, especially in the bases of the lungs, because gravity pulls that fluid down to the bases of the lungs. But you should not get diffuse wheezing in heart failure. I mean, it can occur in some rare cases, but especially for step one purposes, when they tell you there's diffuse wheezing, they are telling you this person does not have pulmonary edema from left heart failure. They have something else going on. And in this case, because he's short of breath and he smoked for 40 years, the diffuse wheezing almost certainly represents COPD. They then tell you that the jugular venous pressure is increased and that there is two plus lower extremity pitting edema. These are classic signs of right heart failure. But remember, they don't tell you whether or not the person has left heart failure. Left and right heart failure are different. The major sign of left heart failure is crackles in the lungs and findings consistent with pulmonary edema. The signs of right heart failure are all the things that this man has, jugular venous pressure being increased and lower extremity pitting edema. They then tell you that he has a two out of six holosystolic murmur that increases in intensity during inspiration. Well, there are three major causes of holosystolic murmurs. You should know these. They are mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and ventricular septal defects. There's no reason for this 60-year-old man without a cardiac history to have a ventricular septal defect, so the murmur must be either mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation. And then they tell you that the murmur's intensity increases during inspiration. This is a finding known as Carvalho's sign, and murmurs that increase with intensity during inspiration usually come from the right side of the heart. So this finding of more intensity during inspiration tells you that the murmur must be tricuspid regurgitation and not mitral regurgitation. And tricuspid regurgitation is very common in people who have right heart failure. They have big dilated right ventricles, it stretches the leaflets of the tricuspid valve and often leads to some tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, next they tell you that S1 and S2 are distant. And this is an interesting finding. Many of you may know that distant heart sounds are seen in patients who have pericardial effusions, and that's true. But you also get them in patients who have lung disease and have big barreled chests trapping lung inside their chest. So in this man who's been smoking for 40 years, almost certainly the distant S1 and S2 are findings consistent with his lung disease, not from a pericardial effusion. Then they tell you the point of maximal impulse is palpable below the sternum. So you may have learned that when patients have left heart failure and an enlarged left ventricle, that the point of maximal impulse for the ventricle can be felt laterally. 
But what you may not know is that when there's right heart failure and the right heart is enlarged, that can move the point of maximal impulse inferiorly so that it's below the xiphoid. It's sometimes called sub-xiphoid or below the sternum. So the fact that this man has a point of maximal impulse below the sternum tells you that he almost certainly has right heart failure and an enlarged right ventricle. And we kind of already know that from all the findings that he's got. Next, they tell you he has hepatomegaly. This is another common finding in patients with severe right heart failure. Fluid backs up into the venous system and it swells and engorges the liver. Okay, so now they're asking you what's the most likely cause, and you need to just recognize that this whole presentation is consistent with core pulmonale and isolated right heart failure. Now, I will tell you, when I was a second-year student, I had never seen a case of core pulmonale. I didn't know a lot about it, and I might have missed it. So this is a great practice question in the QBank for you to see what isolated right heart failure looks like so you can recognize it on your boards. Now, let's go through some of the other answer choices and talk about why they're wrong. So this man does not have mitral regurgitation. We talked about that. He has a holosystolic murmur that increases in intensity during inspiration. That is not mitral regurgitation. That's tricuspid regurgitation. Aortic stenosis causes a crescendo, decrescendo systolic murmur, and he doesn't have that finding, so he doesn't have aortic stenosis. Now, restrictive cardiomyopathy can lead to severe right heart failure, and it can present very similar to the description of this case. But the key thing to note here is that they're telling you that this man has smoked two packs of cigarettes for 40 years. They're telling you that he has diffuse wheezing. All these things are pointing to COPD and lung disease and therefore core pulmonale rather than restrictive cardiomyopathy. If this were going to be a case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, they would give you other clues that he had some disorder that might cause restrictive cardiomyopathy. So he might have sarcoidosis or amyloidosis or something like that. But they're not giving you any of those clues. So this is an important teaching point for how to answer USMLE questions. The question writers are instructed to only include relevant information. So they wouldn't give you all this description of his smoking history and the diffuse wheezing if they were trying to fool you and really he just has a restrictive cardiomyopathy with no clues to that diagnosis. They would never do that to you. So you always want to pick the answer that fits with the description of the case. And in this question, core pulmonale fits far, far better than this man having a restrictive cardiomyopathy while also having to have happened to have smoked for 40 years and have diffuse wheezing on lung exam. And then the last answer is cardiac tamponade. Some people may pick this because of the distant heart sounds. They may think that means a pericardial fusion, but it doesn't. And once again, they're giving you no history that would suggest this man might have a pericardial fusion that's led to cardiac tamponade. So who gets pericardial effusions? Patients with pericarditis or patients with cancer that could metastasize to the pericardium. But they didn't describe any of those things here. So it's extremely unlikely cardiac tamponade is going to be the answer when they haven't given you any hints that this man might have a pericardial effusion. So putting it all together, core pulmonale is far and away the answer that fits best with this man's diagnosis, and that's the answer to the question. Here's the section on heart failure from first aid for the boards. It tells you that right heart failure most often results from left heart failure, and that's true, but you can get isolated right heart failure without left heart failure, and a classic situation for that to occur is someone with long-standing lung disease. And they actually tell you that right here, core pulmonale refers to isolated right heart failure due to a pulmonary cause. And then down here at the bottom, they show you the findings of right heart failure, and this man has all of these, congestive hepatomegaly, jugular venous distension, and peripheral edema. And then they show you the findings of left heart failure, and this man has none of these. He does not have orthopnea, he does not have PND, and he does not have an exam consistent with pulmonary edema. Okay, so what are the takeaways from today's question? Well, I would say the first takeaway is do lots of practice questions. It's very unlikely you're going to be able to recognize the description of core pulmonale the first time you see it. You have to practice and see examples of this so that you can recognize it. Second takeaway I would say is know the difference between findings of right and left heart failure. Just because someone has findings of right heart failure doesn't necessarily mean that they also have left heart failure. They could have isolated right heart failure. Know those findings, know how to recognize them, and know the findings for left heart failure as well. And that concludes today's video question review.